Hey, we're so glad that you clicked on this video and are going to be listening to this message from Pastor Skip. We're in a series right now called In the Room. And in this message, you're going to hear Pastor Skip explain how in the book of Acts, they saw one miracle for every 1.75 years that passed by. But miracles happened then and miracles, we believe, happen today. Hey, one of the things that we're wanting to do as a church is bring Calvary to your city, to your neighborhood. So right now you can go on our website and you can log on to the page. You don't have to log on. You don't have to fill in any information, but you can look for the page calvarynm.church slash locations. Let us know where you're watching from and if you're interested in having a satellite location in your city. With that, enjoy this message. I was uh, following the announcements about baptism. How many of you have been baptized by us over the years? Just raise your hands. Wow, a lot of you. So we used to have baptisms um, before we had a baptism lot here. We used to have them at the beach water park. Do you remember that? Yeah. Remember when there was a beach water park? Uh, so we used to rent that whole facility out for that. And then before that, we'd have them at different swimming pools in town. And uh, Los Altos Pool, exactly. Is that where you were baptized? No. Um, and uh, now we have this baptismal out in our courtyard. It's actually a water feature, but it fills up and heats up, very important, uh, for baptism. So sometimes we have great weather, like today would be a great day for a baptism. But because it's in March, it could be cold, it could be windy. But I just want you to know, we heat the baptismal up to about 90 some degrees. It's like jacuzzi-like, so you're going to be just fine. Uh, turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, where we have um, decided that we would do a series from the same section of Scripture, p uh, picking out different things week by week. We call it In the Room, and uh, today it's In the Room We Wonder. So I am looking at the church you are the church. We know that church is people. When I say I'm looking at the church, the church is not a building. The church is always a reference to people inside of a room, inside of a building. The building to the people is like in a sack lunch, the sack is to the lunch. The sack just holds the lunch. What's really important about the sack isn't the sack. It's what it's holding, the lunch, the food, the meal. So it is with any property, any building, what's most important is what's inside of it. Church is always people, and the ministry of any church is always a ministry to people. So if a church is alive, it's because its people are alive, vibrant. If a church withers and dies, it's not because the carpet is bad and the stucco is fading and the building is withering. It's because the people are withering and dying. I've always loved the story about the young minister who was called to a small town in Oklahoma. He had visions of growing this church. The church was dying. It had been there a long time and it was hard to motivate these people in the small congregation, and so this young guy just gave it all he could, thought of all different ways to encourage them and grow the church. It didn't work. It didn't work. He couldn't motivate them. So one day he just decided to take out an ad in a local newspaper and say, this church is dead, and Sunday afternoon we're going to have a proper burial. So come out to the funeral, and we'll bury this church. Sunday afternoon came. The church had not been that full for 20 years. It was packed. People were standing around watching. There was a casket up front. There were flowers up front. Pastor approached the podium, gave a eulogy, talked about the history of the church, but now it's dead. And now I want you all to come one by one and, and I'll open the casket and you can look inside and pay your last respects to this church. And as you come by, you'll see the reason for its demise. Well, they all came of streaming forward one by one, looking in the casket, turning away in embarrassment because there in the casket was a mirror. So everyone who came by saw himself or herself as they went. So if a church is alive, it's because people are alive. If a church is dead, it's because the people 
are dying. And if you have to convince God's people of their need to come together, they're dying. And yet, we are told that churches all across our country are dying, are closing. I heard this statistic a while back that every week in the United States, 60 churches close their doors. 3,500 people a day are leaving church. I heard that and I went, ah, I wonder, I'm going to do a little research on that. So, according to Lifeway Research, pretty reputable group, they analyzed church data from 34 Protestant denominations and discovered in the year 2019, 4,500 churches closed. It's in one year, 4,500. While 3,000 new congregations were started. So that's a net loss year by year of 1,500 churches. So, some churches are getting very creative to get people in. You know, it used to be you just hang up a banner with service times and people would show up. Those days are long gone. And so I read of one pastor, true story, who turned his church into a bull ring inside the building put up a fence, put up a, a, a real live bull. He was a cowboy, and uh, he rode, this is a Wednesday night service, rode the bull for a few minutes till he was bucked off. When he was bucked off, he got onto a platform and preached his sermon. Another church in Virginia, uh, the pastor decided to zip line from the ceiling to the platform <laughs> as an illustration of the return of Christ. <laughs> really, Jesus is coming back on a zip line? <laughs> same pastor in the same church jumped out of an airplane with a parachute, and while he was in the air in the parachute, he preached a sermon coming down while his congregation was in the building, and then he would land in the church parking lot. Another group of churches decided for their men's ministry to have uh, MMA, MMA fights, mixed martial arts fights for their men's ministry. I don't know why. Maybe to teach guys how to punch somebody out in Jesus' name. <laughs> now listen, the best way to grow a church is for the church to be the church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47 it closes by saying, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's very significant. When the church is what God called the church to be, God will do for the church what he's always wanted to do. So just be the church. Keep your priorities. And that takes us to this series, In the Room. There are certain things that can only happen in the Christian life when Christians gather together. Certain things we experience together in the room. And Acts chapter 2 has been our template. It's what they did. The first Christians in Jerusalem, the first church ever, this is what they did. These are the priorities they kept. And we discovered in verse 42 there are four basic priorities they kept. Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, prayers, among a few other things. We're exploring each of these, but this is what we discover. Church is far more than listening to a sermon or participating in a song service. It's more about sharing life with each other. So let's go back and look at the text that we are taking our cues from. Verse 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. 
Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You know, by the time we're done with this series, you will have memorized this text. I'm convinced. Notice some of the common activities that they participated in when they got together. They were celebrating baptisms in verse 41. They were sharing meals together, verse 46. They were experiencing a sense of mutual joy, verse 46. All of that happened when they got together. All of that happened because of their fellowship together. And then verse 43 is the reaction to God working in their midst. It says, fear came upon every soul. That means a deep sense of awe. And we're going to be looking at verse 43 and 44 in particular. And what I want to really zero in on is this mutuality that we share, this life that we share together. And in particular... The value of your story, that's right, your story, hearing other people's faith stories, God's stories, testimonies, and what that can do. So what we're going to look at is four realities that characterize their fellowship, what they did, what they saw, what they felt, and what they experienced. Notice what they did Verse 44, all who believed were together. That's the first thing they did. They got together. You know, there's a principle, and we keep kind of circling back over this principle throughout this series, and the principle is basically this. Spiritual life requires physical proximity to other believers, that has to be said, especially in a day like today of social media and technology. Spiritual life requires physical proximity to other believers. In the third message that Nate gave in this series, In the Room We Connect, he talked about fellowship. And I want to zero in a little more on that word found in verse 42, fellowship. Now, some of you all already know this. Some of you are Greek scholars. Tell me the Greek word for fellowship. Anybody know? Koinonia. Koinonia. Look at you Greek scholars go. <laughs> Koinonia. It's a beautiful word. Koinonia is found about 20 different times in the Greek New Testament. It has a variety of meanings. It means communion. It means contribution. It means sharing. It means partnership. It probably would be best stated as sharing the life of Christ mutually. Sharing the life of Christ mutually. Fellowship is not just a social gathering, it's a spiritual gathering. People say, come to my house, we'll fellowship. Sometimes they just mean we'll hang out. But it's not primarily a social gathering, it's a spiritual gathering. That is, it's being social over spiritual matters. And when you are social over spiritual matters, you are enjoying fellowship. And that would include hearing people's stories, their testimonies, the stories of how God has been working in their lives. By the way, this was normal practice for the early church. When they got together, when something happened, good or bad, they made it a habit of getting with other believers and telling them what happened, good or bad. Here's a few examples. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Something bad was happening in Jerusalem. A law was passed not to preach the gospel. So what did they do? Let's tell everybody. Let's share this. Let's let them hear the story, what we're going through. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27, after the first missionary journey, 
When the team goes back to Antioch, we are told, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, that's a good thing. They're telling them what God had, had done through their missionary excursion. Again, in chapter 15, verse 4, when they had come to Jerusalem... They were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things that God had done with them. So they made that their standard operating procedure. When something happens, we gather the church together, we let them know our story. Did you know that there is a phrase in the New Testament that is repeated about 60 times, 59 to be exact, almost 60 times. It's the phrase, one another. One another, one another. Here's a few examples. Be kindly affectionate to one another. Love one another. Edify one another. Admonish one another. Be like-minded with one another. Greet one another. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. 60 times, one another, one another, one another. It goes without saying that you can't practice the one another's unless you are actually with one another. So spiritual life requires physical proximity to other believers to practice the one another's. But we live in a day and age that fights against that to some degree, doesn't have to, but it can, and, and it does. We live in a day and age of mobile technology, and mobile technology doesn't necessarily help fellowship. Now, it can, and, and I don't want to disparage anybody who's joining us online. Again, I want to underscore that we welcome you. We understand that's, what, that's the reality we live in. But we always tell those who enjoy these online services to do it with one another, to gather with someone to do that. Because technology, social media in particular, has a way of isolating people. We, we, now, we now think, I tweet, therefore I am. Mobile technology is highly personalized, and because of that, it turns you inward rather than outward. Social media is more about the media and less about the social. On social media, people talk at you, not with you. One author said, every person becomes the creator of his own private world, a secret world of preferences and temptations. It's a world where you choose. You choose everything. You choose your entertainment. You choose your music. You choose your relationships. You become God in your little world, and on your screen, you create the little world that you want. You are the creator of a private universe, and outside of your own private cyberspace is the outer darkness of whatever and whomever you reject. So if you don't happen to like the experiences and conversations in real life, you can just disengage from real life, and you see people all the time even walking and driving, looking, looking, looking at that screen. You can't have fellowship with a screen. Everything about the church fights against that kind of privacy and that kind of isolation. So what they did, they were together together. They were together. Notice second what they saw. Verse 43, Then fear came upon every soul, and many, here it is, wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So stop there for a second. The early church, they were hearing things and they were seeing things. They were hearing the apostles' doctrine taught to them. But now they're also seeing wonders and signs in their midst. Miracles are happening. Lives are being changed. People are being saved. 3,000 souls in one day. That's, that's pretty miraculous. 
And who are the agents of these wonders and signs? Who, who's doing them? The what? The apostles are doing them. The apostles are doing them. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, you might be going, well, I'm off the hook there because I'm not an apostle. Hold that thought. The word apostle means sent out ones. Sent out ones. Men on a mission to be broad about it. Men on a mission. Now, what is happening here is what Jesus said would happen. He said to his apostles, the ones he called out and sent out, he said, these signs will follow you who believe, and told them about those signs. And Mark 16, 20 says, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and listen to this, confirming the word through accompanying signs. Here's a question. That was then. This is now. Does God still do miracles now? <laughs> My God does. Your God does. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. He's the same. Nothing restrains him. What he did then, he can do now. Now, I want to clear that up. When I talk about miracles, I don't I'm not talking about miracles as some people speak about miracles. Some people refer to miracles sort of like miracle on demand. You know, I I claim it in Jesus' name, and I don't know why they always have to have a southern accent, but... (laughs) You know, you're a child of God, you're a son, you're a daughter, you can have healing, you can have prosperity, you just claim it, and you will see your miracle. Listen, God is not a genie. God does what he wants, not what you want, and he does it when he wants it. But the church has been filled with charlatans who say, if you have enough faith, you can see any miracle. And I have talked to young parents who have lost children to death, and they left churches because the pastor said, the reason your son or daughter wasn't healed is you didn't have enough faith. That's sick. That's wrong. That's tragic. That's cruel. So when we talk about miracles, we're not talking about that. But while we might brag and say, well, we don't do that. We're not doing the wrong thing. The fact is, for some of us, we're not expecting God to do anything. I think God wants to move in our church. I think God wants to move in our midst among his people. And signs and wonders do a couple of things. They they don't just confirm the gospel to unbelievers. They affirm the gospel to believers. And you say, well, I'm not an apostle. No, you're not. In the New Testament sense, you're not. In the 12 apostles sense, you're not. But you are sent out, and you do have a mission. And... In the course of normal church life, we are to see from time to time signs and wonders. Not every day, well, expect your miracle today. If you you have a miracle every day, I don't think it's a miracle. It's just what happens. Well, the sun rose, it was a miracle. No, that happens every day. Well, it's a miracle. No, it's not a miracle. A miracle is a, is a, a circumvention of natural law. But signs and wonders do happen, and I think they should happen. You say, well, not like in the book of Acts. I mean, the book of Acts, there's miracles happening everywhere, like all the time. Well, that's because you can sit down and read the book of Acts. In a couple hours, you have read the whole book of Acts, and you might think, miracles happen every five minutes. The book of Acts is a record of the church over a 35-year period. If you were to count them up, there's 20 miracles in the book of Acts. 20 miracles over a 35-year period is is a miracle every 1.75 years. I think we see that. I think we see God move in miraculous ways, signs and wonders. Now, here's the value of telling somebody else what God has done. It does something for us. 
when we have a baptism. So many of you raised your hands, you've been baptized, and we share a story. This is how God rescued me. This is what God saved me from. This is what God did in my life. And then somebody gets baptized. That's a testimony. Weekly on Wednesday nights, we did it also this morning, but every Wednesday night we have prayer requests on the screen as we pray for the people in our church. But we always have a praise report. What God has done, answering a prayer. That's a testimony. In between services, when you meet people, you may hear them tell you what God has done in their lives this week. That's a testimony. When you're out in the community, like I was this week, I was in an office with somebody and somebody else walked by, recognized me. She came in, her name was Mary, and she told me all the things God had been doing in her family through the years. That was a testimony. All of that to say, when we are in the room together, it's not just for a sermon or to sing songs, but to hear others' stories. Testimonies. Let's keep going on that. What they did, what they saw. Third, notice what they felt. It says in verse 43, then fear came upon every soul. Now, I need to explain that because you might be thinking, you know, Wizard of Oz, lion shaking, afraid of that great Wizard of Oz, or a child afraid of the dark. Well, the word here in Greek is phobos, phobia, we get our, but that's a bad idea in your mind. A better translation is awe, wonder, amazement, a sense of awe. One translation says, a sense of reverence seized everyone. I, I, I want a seizure like that. A sense of reverence seized everyone. Why is it? Why, why were they experiencing this awe, this amazement, this fear? Back to last week's study, because they were experiencing the manifest presence of God. Remember that last week? We talked about the difference between the presence of God versus the manifest presence of God. Where is God? He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But there's a difference between God's presence everywhere and his manifest presence, God is not working the same in every person in this congregation. He's not working the same in every family in this church. He's not working the same in every church in this community. They were experiencing the manifest presence of God. It produced wonder. The feeling produced when a person realizes God showed up. God is at hand. He is near. When Jesus raised the son of a widow who lived in Nain, the Bible says, then fear came upon all and they glorified God. Manifest presence. Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus, fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Manifest presence. So here in Acts 2, fear, awe, reverence came upon every soul it says every soul, unbelievers and believers were in awe. They were not in awe of church buildings, because there weren't any. They were not in awe of church programs, because there weren't any. They were not in awe of church attendance, though that was pretty significant, 3,000 new souls. They were in awe of the supernatural character of the life of the church. Supernatural character of the life of the church. This is the sense that we get when we hear your stories, when we read your praise reports. Wednesday night in the prayer list was a praise report, and we showed it up again today. Did you read it? My grandchild no longer needs medication. On Wednesday night, uh, no, not on Wednesday night, but on, on, on my phone through the week, I go to the Calvary prayer list. You know, pray for this, pray for that, and I, I do that. But sprinkled with the prayer requests are the praise reports. One that I read this week, 
said, the baby's surgery was successful. He can see and hear. See that? Aww. That's the awe. That's the reverence. Another one, my emergency surgery was a success. Thank God for my eyesight. See, there's an awe that is created when we realize that God is at hand. And you don't have to manufacture that. You don't have to try to work people up and, and prance around and say, say hallelujah. Come on, say it, say it. You know, you don't have to do that. It will just happen when God shows up. So that's what they did, what they saw, and what they felt. Let's close with this, what they experienced. Go down to verse 44. Now, all who believed were together, that's where we started, and look at the last little phrase, had all things in common. We're going to explain more of that next week because the verses following will add some insight. But basically, it means they shared everything. They, they were involved in each other's lives. They were willing to get messy. You have to be willing to get messy if you're going to get involved with other people's lives. If you get close to people, you'll get messy. But that's where the joy really is. Fellowship is when we gather with a goal, and the goal is that we stimulate one another to spiritual growth. And everybody should and could participate in that, stimulating one another. You know, throughout this whole series, we keep kind of circling back to Hebrews 10, almost every week, I think. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But listen to verse 24 and verse 25 together of Hebrews 10. Let us consider one another. There's one another. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. See, that's the all things in common now, there's, there's a few glaring facts about the early church in Jerusalem, the first church in Jerusalem, I want you to consider. First, this church was large. Book of Acts, Book of Acts opens up, there's 120 people. Then on this day, how many people get saved? 3,000, so now you have 3,120. That's a large church. That's a mega church. When people say, well, you know, the first megachurch didn't happen until 18... No, the first megachurch is here. The first megachurch was the first church. Because the Lord is adding daily those who are being saved. And I think that is the norm. This is the template. The Lord wants to add. The Lord wants to move. One blogger that I came across said... Having attended megachurches for the past few years, I can testify with perfect clarity that it's fascinatingly easy to slip in and out of them, avoiding all human interaction. Not in Jerusalem. That wouldn't happen. Because in Jerusalem, it was just too sticky. Uh, there's going to be somebody who's going to notice you and glom onto you and get involved and get all up in your business. So the church was large, but the second glaring fact, though the church was large, everyone was experiencing fellowship, koinonia. Verse 44, all who believed were together. You know, it's possible to have a large group and yet have intimate fellowship. This is important because every now and then somebody will say, I'm leaving your church. I want to find a smaller church where I know everyone. Okay, that's fair. I get it. I understand. But when you go, you best pray that the church you go to doesn't grow. That's what you're going to have to do. Go in there and just pray. Lord, I pray nobody else will come. Because if it grows and grows and grows, and you're going to be unhappy again. And you're just going to be chasing that tail everywhere. Can you imagine somebody saying... Um, you know, I, I hope our church doesn't grow. In Jerusalem, imagine going from 120 to th over 3,000. So it is possible to have a large group of people and yet have intimate fellowship. 
But there's a twofold structure that will enable that also seen in our text. In verse 46, continuing daily with one accord in the what? In the what? The temple. The temple was huge, 35-acre complex in Jerusalem. Huge courtyards. So they were in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity in heart. So the twofold structure was big group and small group. Big group in the temple, small group, house to house. In the first group, the first structure, the temple, that's formal. That's where they're hearing the apostles' doctrine. The second structure, house to house, that's informal. You're able to share with other people. In the first structure, the temple, that says the preacher, the apostle, has something to say. In the second structure, house to house, that format says you have something to say. In the big group, the temple, today, we study the scripture and worship God. In the small group, we apply the scriptures and walk with God. The first structure, the big group, says God is most high. Our worship is awesome. God is most high. In the small group, we're saying God is most nigh. He's close at hand. We're hearing each other's stories, testimonies. I'm going to close with that thought of a testimony. A testimony is a statement or a declaration of a witness, usually in a Modern courtroom, under oath, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And one of the most powerful lines of evidence is eyewitness testimony. In the New Testament, a witness, very similar. It's somebody who sees something, hears something, and says something. So Paul was a witness. He shared his testimony. Whenever he would go places, he would typically tell his faith story. So in Acts 22, he's in front of the Jewish leaders. He tells his story, what happened to him, who he was, what happened to him. Acts 24, he's before the Roman governor, Felix, tells his story. He writes to the Philippian church, tells his story. You have a story. You have a testimony. We need to hear it. Here's some reasons why your testimony is important. Number one, because people love stories. People love stories. It's the reason we go to movies. It's the reason we watch series on Netflix. It's the reason we read a book. We love to hear a story. And when people hear stories of your struggles, your mistakes, your failures, but God's faithfulness in the midst of your failures, you know that brings so much hope and encouragement. People realize You don't have to be perfect to be used by God. If God used him, he can use anybody. So people love stories. Second, a reason your testimony is important, it's yours. It's your personal story. You get to tell what happened to you. Nobody can take that from you. Sometimes unbelievers try to argue the facts of the Bible. That's fine, but they can't argue with what happened to you because it happened to you. They may not agree with you. They might not agree with the power you are ascribing in your testimony, but it's your story. In John chapter 9, Jesus healed a man who was blind from birth. And when he was healed, the Pharisees got all up in his grill and tried to discredit everything he was saying and say Jesus was this and that. And I love what the man said. He goes, whether that's true or not, I don't know. There's only one thing I know. I was blind, and now I see. That's my testimony, my personal story. Here's a third reason your testimony is important. It glorifies God. You're telling what God has done. It's not about you. It's about God working in you. And my testimony shows that God is bigger than my story or my experience or my failure. Jesus put it this way, let your light so shine before men that people will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Not say, wow, what an awesome person you are. 
but glorify God. And a good testimony will do that. It glorifies God. A fourth reason your testimony is important, it will keep our memory fresh. It keeps our memory fresh. You know, there are certain things God never wants us to forget. Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, remember from where you have fallen. Go back and do your first works. There are certain things we're told to remember. That's why we take communion frequently. To remember what Jesus has done. To always go back to that. So, life takes its toll. Struggles can blind us from the reality of God's presence. But when we share our testimony, our story, what God has done, is doing in our lives, it keeps our memory fresh. Fifth reason your testimony is important. It's a weapon. It's a weapon. Pull that baby out and use it. Revelation 12, they overcame him, that is their enemy, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Your testimony is a weapon. Your testimony uses your past to help you march into the future. If God did something then, God can do it again. David was facing Goliath. Saul said, you're just a kid. You can't fight this giant. And Why should I send you out there? David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He used his past to march into his future. So it's a weapon. Sixth and finally, your testimony will bring a celebration. When we see a praise report, you hear people clap. When I told you some of those praise reports, there was a ah, oh, an awe. Oh. It brings a celebration. When Jesus healed a demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5, he began to proclaim it in the Decapolis, all that Jesus had done for him, and they all marveled. We want to celebrate more. We want to hear what God is doing in your life. So we gather in the temple, but also from house to house, so that can happen. And we're going to put one more uh, verse of scripture up on the screen, Psalm 145, verse 4. We're going to close with this, but the way we're going to close with this is a little bit differently. Let's all stand to our feet, and we're going to make a public proclamation together. Uh, we're going to say this psalm, this one sentence together, as our parting proclamation one generation giving it to another. So let's, let's put some feeling into this. Let's say Psalm 145, verse 4 together. Ready? One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Father, we just pray in the name of your son Jesus, whom we worship, whom we love, who changed our lives, who saved our lives, who is working in our lives, Lord, we can't wait to share it with other people, the next generation, your mighty acts. Use our story, use our testimony, and bless us when we hear others tell us what you have done. It gives us courage and hope to go on in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, what a great message that was from Pastor Skip. I just loved being encouraged with the fact that God is doing things still in my friends' lives and in my life. And maybe you found that when you share your story with somebody, that it lifts them up, that it fills their sails. Or when somebody shares their story with you, that it fills your sails and it helps you to have greater faith and trust in the Lord as you examine his faithfulness in others' lives. We'd love to hear your story. If you would email us at mystory at calvaryabq.org and just tell us what is God doing in your life. And if you'd love to get the word out about Calvary Church and the messages here. You can give, you can join us as a partner. Just click give in the top right corner of our website, calvarynm.church. And let's see how many people we can get this message in front of. God bless.